St. Clair Church of the Messiah in our leisurely stroll through the book of Revelation. And uh, we're taking a long time in Revelation chapter 13, the darkest chapter in the book of Revelation, uh, the one that talks the most about the devil. And, uh, and it seems to talk about our powerlessness against the powers of this world and even the defeat of human beings. Uh, hope you read all of Revelation chapter 13. We're just going to continue to look at a few verses at the beginning because we're doing a leisurely stroll through the book of Revelation. We're not in any rush <laughs> to get through it, and we're trying to keep all of these devotionals uh, pretty short, between 11 and 14 minutes every week. So let's just pray. Uh, Father, uh, it's a good thing to look at dark things if they're real. And uh, Father, we thank you that uh, you call us to look at dark things uh, not so that we would fall in love with the darkness or be uh, afraid of the darkness, but that we look at it because it's real, and uh, we look at it in light of Jesus and, um, and what he's accomplished for us on the cross and, uh, and his coming again in glory. So, Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth as we look once again into your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Revelation chapter 13. So here's the thing. I, I, we're taping this, and uh, they've begun a, um, a uh, I think they said the trial is going to take about two months or something, but in France, uh, th uh, they reissued the cartoons that I think five years ago in 2015 led to the, the killing at the Charlie, at Charlie Hebdo. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I never listen to news or watch TV, so I read things in the paper. I don't always know how to pronounce them because <laughs> I only see them read, uh, written. So uh, and, and, uh, the, this uh, mag satirical magazine in France published some mocking pictures of Muhammad in 2015. And then there was uh, some people, uh, is Islamists, who uh, killed, I think, seven of the people, wounded several, and ended up another bit of a reign of terror over, and there's, there's, some, there's some trials about it. Now, I mention all of this because of the whole odd thing about blasphemy in our culture. And, and uh, just before I say anything more about it, listen to how it, it's, it's present in the text. So it's good to think a little bit about what's been going on in the text and how we react to this, what the text is saying to us, if we're honest. So here's the text. We're just going to look at the game at the first four verses of chapter 13. So a leisurely a stroll. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous, notice that, blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it. Now, just to be clear, the, the importance of blasphemy in the text is, is very important. If you just sort of skip down a little bit in verse 5, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty, that's excessive pride, and blasphemous words. In verse 6, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. So this idea of blasphemy is essential to the beast, that somehow or another, uh, the beast utters blasphemy. It's, in a sense, part of its identity because it's actually written on it. It doesn't only speak blasphemy. It, it's proud about it. it it's like uh, it has the tattoos to show that it's very interested in blasphemy, proud of blasphemy. And that's an essential aspect of this creature, which is uh, the, that which rules in a culture, not just the state, but also, in a sense, the media, education, art, law, um, uh, economics. Uh, it's part of the, the ruling of the society is this beast. And it, it has blasphemy about it. But just think about this for a second. I began by talking about Charlie Hebdo. Generally speaking, uh, many, many people in, in North America and Western Europe were very, very concerned about offending Muslims. And uh, uh, they have... Uh, in a sense, a very, very uh, a, a large set of rules about what you're allowed and not allowed to say about Muhammad or about is Islam in general. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them can be very vociferous and put great pressure on if those are violated, even though in our culture, 
uh, in general, people have a, a fair degree of freedom of speech. At least in most of our culture, we do. And so in a sense, we, we think of on one level blasphemy in connected to a, a group that you sort of want to appease and, and don't want to look prejudiced and racist about. But on the other hand, we, we, we don't think much of them being so thin-skinned. I'm just talking about this in general. I'm not talking about me. I'm just talking about in general in the culture. And I think there's a lot of, there's some fairness in terms of how I've characterized this. But apart from Islam, generally speaking in our culture, we don't even understand blasphemy. Like you could easily imagine that if a comic came out and said, I'm a blasphemer, and on stage began by saying, I'm a blasphemer, everybody would laugh. In fact, actually, uh, it's in fact viewed as being uh, heroic and wise and funny to do things which uh, denigrate or put down Jesus or make Jesus look ridiculous or Christianity look ridiculous. It's viewed as a, a sense of being culturally knowing, culturally sophisticated, culturally wise, as being praiseworthy. So we actually here in a very, very odd sense, you see a little bit of an insight even for many Christians, we have a hard time understanding what blasphemy even is. But don't you see, in a sense, like last time I talked a little bit about the mystery of the fact that you have this beast, and it's obviously a creature of horror, and it's obviously, obviously just an animal, less than a human being, and yet people worship it, and people obey it, and people follow it. And they allow it to have control and authority. And you wonder how on earth could this possibly be? But at the same time, we can already see that there's something beast-like in North American culture. That we've lost any sense of there even being anything wrong about blasphemy, about the triune God of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons, one God of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. That we've lost any sense that to slander, insult, mock, you know, make mincemeat of, that there's anything wrong or inappropriate, but in fact that it's wise. And can't you see that in one level this is warning us that there's something beast-like that's already present in our Canadian culture, something of the dragon where we've lost the sense of smell, of sulfur, of his presence. And, um, and so that's one of the things that we see here in this particular text. And the, 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 the beast very clearly has the dragon's authority. And as I talked about in an earlier way, we've lost this imagery of the dragon. Dragons aren't wise. Dragon is the serpent. Dragon is the devil. In other words, if I was to re reword this as I read this, um, and I saw a, a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diademons horns and blasphemous blasphemous names on its heads and the beast that I saw was like a leopard its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority the devil that's in a sense the source of the beast's power now here's the thing in this um, that um, what, the, Bi what the, the Bible what the Bible is portraying here is not the same type of thing that's often talked about by social justice warriors and, uh, and critical theory in, in much of Canada and, and the United States and, and in fact Western Europe. The Bible here isn't saying that there's something inherently wrong with power or authority. But what it's warning us about is that it's possible for power and authority to be completely and utterly twisted and, per and usurped and perverted so that it becomes something demonic. So the solution isn't that you have a different group of people having supposedly the controls of the beast because ultimately the, the real control of the beast is, is, the, is the devil. The solution is, is that you in a sense come under Jesus' power and authority and there's a type of godly authority and order in society rather than a demonic one. This idea of being, you know, of, a, of, a, of something counterfeit is captured very well in verse 3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? This is obviously very, very clear language that what, in a sense, the beast does is it, it, 
it, prevent, it presents a counterfeit gospel. And the counterfeit gospel, you see, the, the Christian gospel, the real good news is this remarkable thing that God, in the person of his son, entered the human story uh, in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And what was in the womb of the Virgin Mary uh, was perfect man and perfect God, two natures but one person, actually so weak, so helpless, that it had to be the zygote. It had to connect to Mary's womb. And, 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 and this, this, this God, the Son of God, who's Jesus, taking into himself our human nature, he lives a fully human life, including going through the birth canal, but he does it without sin. He does it without rebellion against God. He does it without idolatry. He does it only always fully in love and in justice and in mercy and in compassion. And he never rebels against God. He never does anything that breaks his relationship or his fellowship with God the Father. And living a completely and utterly human life and doing miracles that show that only he could, that he doesn't pray for miracles, he just does them, that this is in fact not only a human being but also God, but not two creatures but just one person. And in his sinless life, he willingly submits to death and he dies upon the cross and his death is completely, it's not an apparent death, it's a real death. And, and all of the historical evidences emphasize his real death. And it, all of the historical evidence points to the fact that Jesus says, I'm going to die a type of death that he couldn't manufacture himself because only Rome could do it. And that on the third day, I'm going to rise from that, that the, that the grave will be empty and I will have defeated death. I will have risen from the dead. And what Jesus does is something, his, the combination of his sinless life, his death upon the cross, and his resurrection where he appears to people so that they know that the grave is empty, he appears, that this is the means by which God will reconcile us to himself so that our fellowship and our relationship with the, the true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one, three persons, one God, can be restored. And it's not just an appearance of death. It's, it's, it's real and so what the, what the beast is doing here is it, it, it creates a counterfeit Christ, a counterfeit gospel that leads us to worship us. And while we should really say, listen, if Jesus is able to live such a life and die and, 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 and in his death, he, uh, he tastes all there is to taste of death, all there is to taste of sin, and on the third day he conquers sin and conquers death, he is God, the Son of God, who reconciles us to himself. Who can stand against him? Who can fight against him? Who is like him? But instead, the beast creates this counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit savior, that we now marvel at the beast and think, who can defeat the beast? Who can ever possibly stand against it? And so it is what the, what the beast does in all things. It takes, in a sense, a proper sense that there should be some order and, and all and, and just relationships within society. And it takes that idea and it perverts it. And it, it uses these types of things to grab power and, uh, and, and, um, and control for itself and to do it in a way that only brings death, only brings death. And so there's a call here, folks, to discern when the state becomes demonic because the devil can infiltrate and affect social structures, whether it's the media or banking or corporate or government or culture, it can. It can blind us. And it can create within us this false sense that somehow or another the things of this earth and the things of evil are something which we cannot possibly fight against, that we must, in a sense, live with and surrender to. But they are wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong, and we'll talk more about this in our next video. Let's just pray. Father, uh, grip us again with the truth of Jesus, of what he did for us in his life and death and resurrection. Grip us again with the profound truth that Jesus will come again. Father, grip us again with the profound truth that evil is not the final word, that injustice and hatred and death are not the final things, that they, they do not have the final say and, fa and final control, and that we should never surrender to evil or injustice, that we should never surrender but keep our eyes on you and look forward to that day when your son returns and all evil and all evil forces are completely and utterly pacified and destroyed. Father, grant us such great hope of your sovereignty and your goodness, your love and your mercy and your grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless, folks. Mm -hmm.